A, just a quick announcement as we get started, and it comes from our security team. You've probably noticed that they have signs on the doors. They're trying to lock all the doors for the kids' practice. It's really the security. So I, I, I got to kind of confess because I came here, whatever, two or three weeks ago, and I saw the sign. And so immediately I thought, you know, when football teams practice their trick plays, they try and keep the press out, right? You know, that's where you do your onside kicks and your fake punts. And so on. I thought, I wonder what the, what the youth choir is doing in here. You know, they're practicing their, their secret things going on here. Turns out it's not secret. It's really just about security. And so they're asking if we can stay out till 6 o'clock. I know some of you like to come in and just sit quietly. The, what they're really concerned about is they're trying to figure out and trying to protect where children are knowing what adults should be with them and what else adults shouldn't be. So they're asking if we can honor that. We don't come in until 6 o'clock. They'll unlock the doors. We'll finish the practice and unlock the doors, and then we can come in and so on. I know it's a kind of a nice, quiet place to sit, but they're asking not till 6 o'clock if that's uh, doable for you. They would be greatly appreciated. So I wanted to pass that on to you. Uh, other than that, um, we are carrying on in our series. If you're new with us, uh, welcome. We uh, gather week by week to uh, study God's Word, and uh, hopefully that's been helpful and meaningful to you as we look at uh, various topics. What we are trying to do is look at things that are commanded for all believers. That is, there are certain commands, in the, especially in the New Testament, generally they flow through the, all of Scripture, uh, but that all believers are supposed to do. Because some people ask the question, okay, if you're a Christian, what, what should you do? What should you do? And so the first command that we looked at is repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And so uh, just as sort of a way of review, that idea of baptism is really a sign of something that's happening on the inside. It's a way of showing sort of the repentance and the new life, a kind of a physical sign, one that people can see of reflecting what's going on on the inside. And so I've kind of used this little phrase, if you've been here the last uh, several weeks, I've used this phrase that it's a spiritual sign uh, excuse me, a physical sign of a spiritual reality. That's really what baptism is. And then we talked about the Lord's Supper. And of course, you know, bread and wine or bread and juice take on this meaning of Christ's body and Christ's blood. And it's commanded, do this in remembrance of me. And in the end, it is a sign, a physical sign. We eat real bread and drink real juice of something that's a spiritual reality of partaking of our Savior's flesh and blood. It's actually the way we participate in his death, which if you think of the atrocity of his crucifixion, what a, what a privilege to participate in, in the way he prescribed, simply by eating bread and drinking the wine or drinking the juice to remember what had happened to him. And so that too is a physical sign of a spiritual reality. We've talked about uh, uh, Scripture and uh, understanding God's Word. The command is to hear the Word of the Lord. And, and yet God's Word has a living, active component in our lives. And so God's Word is more than sort of words in a book. Ultimately, God's Word refers to the Son and who, the Son who is transforming us uh, through the power of the Spirit. So really reading God's Word isn't just like reading Shakespeare. It actually takes on sort of a, a, different, uh, a, a different component. Again, we use that phrase, a really a physical sign of a spiritual nourishment, a spiritual reality. We talked about prayer last time together. And uh, that falls into the same category, sort of the, the, the challenge in prayer uh, that we tend to come to is that we want to pray and we have all these requests that we present before God and all of that is good. And then as it turns out, after we presented them, he already knew them before we started. And then you feel, well, what am I doing this for? And, and, and yet there's more to prayer than informing God. Ultimately, he's already informed, but it plays a role in how we live uh, and how we think about uh, uh, our need for God. And so we talked a little bit about prayer last week, and we're going to carry on this week. What I realize is that we haven't prayed. So let's pray, because I was just going to get started here, and we should pray. Father, what a privilege it is that you reveal yourself to us, that you have made yourself known. Father, there are some through history who have thought that you created all things and then walked away, and that you weren't concerned about us, and it's like a 
old style clock that got wound up and then you walk away and it just unwinds and whatever happens, happens. But we recognize that that's not true, that your word is living and active and that lives have been changed because of the gift of your son and then the role of the spirit in inhabiting believers. And so we're grateful that you make yourself known. We're grateful that you speak to us through your word. And so, Father, we've gathered here this evening as students of your word, as disciples longing to hear from you, uh, to have the nourishment of your word, and then to be doers of your word, uh, obeyers of your word. And so we pray that your spirit would be present, that you would speak to us, that you would guide us to all truth and righteousness, and that in that you would begin to or continue the process of transforming us molding us and making us to be more like your son. Pray our time together would be beneficial and encouraging as we look at your word, Father. May it um, bring joy and bring sustenance even through the rest of the week. And so we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and through the Spirit. Amen. So... I've spent a lot of time uh, and really continue to spend a lot of time thinking about sort of what the Bible is. I do a lot of Bible teaching and writing and so on, and even together in our studies, we've talked a little bit about the Bible. I'm going to make a suggestion today. You don't have to agree with it, but it's, it's pretty general, pretty basic. If it's God's Word, and it is, if God sort of wrote it or oversaw the writing of his word through his spirit using human authors, which he did, then it is whatever he wants it to be, right? Is that fair? That he, he picked that it would be in, in our book, 66 books. It's not really the number that's important. In, in Hebrew, they would number it differently and so on. But these books, these precise books, and only these books, not other books, but these books and so on, uh, this was his message to us. And so, how do we kind of put it all together? How do, how do we look at God's Word? What are we supposed to do with it? And so, I'm going to make a suggestion. And you can think about it, think about it as we're working through a variety of passages this evening. I'm going to suggest the Bible, what it does explicitly through most pages in Scripture, and implicitly on the pages where it's not explicit, is it answers a very simple question. This is the question I think God's Word is answering. What's God like? What's He like? And the reason I ask it that way is because I want you to help to see that however anybody answers that question, how you might answer it, how I might answer it, how someone in the community who isn't a believer might answer it, how an atheist might answer it, how an agnostic might answer it. However you answer that question, what's God like? Notice I only made it three words. I could have said what is. I like what's, right? Just kind of shorter. Um, however we answer that is precisely how we live. It's precisely how we live. So let's just some examples. For many people, through much of church history, they have understood God to be kind of this grumpy old man with a, with a white beard who is a lawgiver. That's primarily what God is. What's God like? He's an old man who's a lawgiver, which means your life is lived out obeying, keeping the law, or feeling his condemnation because he didn't right? So a lot of people, you say God, and their, their association is, oh, it's probably mad at me again. I mean, I messed up over there, and I screwed up in this thing again, and, and I can never please him, right? If, if all God is is a lawgiver, and we are breakers of the law, th then we always fall short of what God is offering. Does that make sense? So whatever God's like, if that's what God's like, it affects how we might live, now, a lot of people live today that God's indifferent. And if you push them real hard, sometimes people will say in sort of popular culture today, quasi-Christianish in, in some places, well, I mean, in the end, I think I'll be good enough. Like, I'll be good enough to get to heaven. That, that is, God is concerned on relative levels of goodness, 
right? And so uh, I'm better. What we often mean by good enough is not if we listed all the things you did wrong, but much more, I'm a little better than those folks, right? So he's probably going to let me in. I'm sure he's going to let me in. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, and so that's how they live if that's what God is like, that he is kind of wishy-washy, kind of, you know, indifferent, and good is, 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 is good enough, that, that type of idea. Some people live and pray like, more like God's kind of your, your, I don't know, you call it your genie, he grants your wishes, your, your credit card. God, I need this, 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 and this, and I'll pray really specifically. I need these first three done by October 7th, right? And then these three things I'd really like to have done full. And, and so I'm praying to you, and it's really God is someone who needs to fulfill your wishes and your desires. There's a whole movement within churches, I don't, I don't really know if I should call it Christianity, within some churches that, that kind of teach God this way. What's he like? He's there to fulfill your wishes and your desires. You just don't ask enough, you don't ask the right way, or you didn't buy one of my prayer towels because that'll really get you going, right? And, and, and so what God's like is presented a lot of different ways and people think about it different ways. And I think that's, that's part of what the Bible or, or, or maybe a way of thinking about God's word. Some people think, well, I don't believe in God. So when you ask what, what's God like, he's not there. That is, I live with no accountability. I'm not created by God. I'm not made in God's image. I do what I want. I live without any accountability because I don't believe God is there. And they live their lives that way right? So there's lots of ways to answer that type of question, and we tend to live however we would answer it, even if we don't do it sort of out loud. You know, we, we, we might never really face the idea of what God's like. We live sort of filling in how he might be. And, and so people would see um, uh, their understanding of God and are articulated in many different ways. So the question is, I want to try and tackle how is the Bible presenting the answer to the question, what's God like? So I'm going to start in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Um, I'm even going to put it up here on the screen because I want to really, really help you. So there's the question, what's God like? So we begin, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And of course, you knew that. And so, okay, if we stop there, what's God like? He's the creator. He's the creator of everything, right? It's pretty straightforward. That's how he introduces himself. I'm the one who made everything. Everything you've ever seen, everything that you are, everything that you've ever touched, everything that you ever... I made it all. That's the idea there. I made it all. Um, and so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's how it begins. There are some passages where God reveals a lot about himself. And so if you have your Bibles, make your way to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to say, what can we learn about a God who reveals himself as creator? What, what, what more is there to learn in God is revealing himself as creator? Now, Exodus chapter 3, let's just quickly talk through Genesis, because we're kind of jumping from Genesis 1-1 all the way uh, to Exodus uh, chapter 3. So, Genesis really, the, the first uh, 11 chapters is kind of an introduction. It's very hard to understand sort of the time that elapses. We don't really know when creation was, and there's lots of theories, and whatever one you hold to, generally you're adamant, right? Even though no one knows, everyone's adamant about their position, because it's clearly not the other position, whatever. But it's, it's, it's hard. There's creation. And then very quickly, by Genesis chapter 6, if you remember, sin is introduced in Gen chap Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the first murder is in Genesis is chapter 4, and, and by Genesis 6, God's like, it's done. It is so wicked, so evil, I'm flooding the whole thing, we're going to start over. And he literally kills every living thing, save one family, right, no one is family, and two of every animal, more precisely, two of every unclean animal, seven of every clean animal, but that wrecks all the, you know, the two-by-two two stories, there's lots of two-by-two two stories, so if you read carefully, they kept seven of all the clean animals, two of all the unclean, but anyway, uh, save a, a group of animals on the ark, and everything gets killed, and, and they start over. That's six chapters in, 
And, and so it's hard to understand kind of what's happening. Then God says, I want you to spread out, multiply, and fill the earth. And people are like, no, let's all gather together and let's be together and create one city and we'll create a tower to God, right? And they, what they get? Maybe eight stories high? And it's like, look at us, God. We got eight stories going on here, right? I mean, we're really, they would have built kind of this, it's called a ziggurat back in the day. And they would have built this kind of pyramid looking thing, not, not as fancy as the Egyptian pyramids would become. But uh, nonetheless, that's the, the introduction. God, of course, uh, stops their building by changing their language and by adding languages people spread. And, and it's like, where is this story going to go? Because it's gone really bad really early on, right? Chapter 3 is sin. Chapter 4 is murder. Chapter 6 is start over. Chapter 11 is now we're going to spread people out because they're not obeying by changing their languages and so on. And then in Genesis 12, God says, here's what I'm going to do. And it's really kind of the first time that God says, here's my plan. And he gives his plan to this guy named Abram, who he'll re rename Abraham. And he says that I'm going to build a nation out of you and your wife. And through you, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. So number one, there's a clear plan. And number two, I have no idea what that means, right? I mean, it's not particularly like, how are you going to do this? And how is it going to work? And then it turns out Abraham and his wife aren't able to have children anyway. And so for 25 years, it kind of feels like, man, this thing isn't really going anywhere. But Genesis 12 is really the beginning of understanding God's plan. Of course, God's plan throws, flows through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob is the one with the 12 sons, and it really gets highlighted with son number 11 through Joseph. And by the end of Genesis, uh, you remember Joseph gets sold into slavery in Egypt, and then there's the famine, and Joseph was involved in working for the Pharaoh and preparing for seven years of plenty, prepared for seven years of famine, and then the famine's in Canaan, the brothers come, remember the whole thing. And they all end up by the end of Genesis in Egypt, and God is providing for them there. And it's really the start of this nation, that was promised back in Genesis chapter 12. So you turn the page from the end of Genesis chapter 50 to Exodus chapter 1 and 400 years elapses. And now this family that had been moved into Egypt is now a nation. We really don't know how big they are. Same thing, everyone has a position. They know they're right and everyone else is wrong. I, I don't really know how that works. But th they were now a large people. Some say half a million, some say at least a million. Some would go up to three, four, maybe even five million. Yes, that's exactly right, one of those or another one, right? But they were the, a nation that now kind of threatened the pharaoh, the latest pharaoh, is threatened by how big and powerful and strong they've become within Egypt, living within Egypt. And so they get enslaved, and then God raises up Moses to pull them out of the land. And, and so this really in Genesis 3, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 3, is a story of Moses. And if you remember, Moses has a really interesting birth. The Pharaoh has said, okay, I don't know how to stop these people. Here's, here's the plan. Kill all the male boys. When a baby is born, if it's a boy, drown it in the Nile. And if it's a girl, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay? And, and so, you know, Moses' mom kind of nuances this throw your baby boy in the, in the Nile. She does, but in a basket. You know, kind of a whoosh, puts the little basket in, right? And then the basket's discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And really, Moses gets raised as an Israelite in the house of Pharaoh, an Egyptian. And so um, he has this unique upbringing of being an Israelite. I mean, he's an Israelite like all the others were, but yet he's kind of raised as an Egyptian. And later, as an adult, he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite. He ends up killing the Egyptian. Doesn't seem like he intended to. He intended to stop him. He ends up killing him. The Israelites find out and so on. So he fears it's going to get back to Pharaoh and that he's going to die, and he flees. So he's 40 years old when that murder happens, and he flees to Midian. I don't know, I always just kind of, when we talk about places, I always want to kind of show you, can I just show you where this is? Is that okay? I, I, I would feel better. Um, yeah, let's go here. So, let's go like this. All right, yeah, you can see that. Good. So, um, so, the land of Canaan is right here, all right? But uh, Joseph gets sold into slavery and comes down over here, and here is the land uh, that they're given uh, where the Israelites live, the land of Goshen. 
okay, is in Egypt. And, and then they're going to leave. Uh, uh, Moses is going to flee. We're not at the Exodus yet. Moses is going to flee, and he's going to go over here to Midian, and he is going to end up at a mountain in Midian. So the big thing is, if you know about the debates, is that here is Mount Sinai, which is probably not in Midian, and here's another theory as to where Mount Sinai is, and that is in Midian, but if you think that, you're crazy. It says the people who think it's over there. Again, everyone's absolutely sure of their position. It's a fascinating history is how we pick what mountain they were at. Let's just be sure they know what mountain they're at. We're not sure. Map doesn't help at all at this point, so I don't even know why we did this. Let's, let's go. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. Moses has been in Midia for about 40 years. He has been tending sheep. He is married and has children. And he, we pick it up in his sheep tending days. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. A couple of things. Sometimes the mountain is called Horeb, this, pardon me, this particular name here, and sometimes it's called Mount Sinai. So just so you know, that's the same name, although someone argues somewhere that they're different, but it's the same name uh, used, it's two different names used for the same mountain. So they're at this mountain here, it's being called Horeb, uh, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire within, from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So he, Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. All right. So if you went to Mount Sinai, whoop, if you went to Mount Sinai, and this would be the traditional location of Mount Sinai is right here. It's known as Jebel Musa, uh, the mountain of Moses. And if you went there, and, and I've been there. Um, now I lost it. Here we go. If, if you went to, to Mount Sinai, there is a monastery there at the base of Mount Sinai known as St. Catherine's Monastery. And we'll just grab it here real quick. And at that monastery is a bush. And as, wouldn't you know, that, that bush, even though it burnt uh, 1,500 years before Christ, so 3,500 years ago, it's still there. And you can see it, and it looks just like, whoop that. There you go. So there's the burning bush, right? If you ever went there at St. Catherine's Monastery, that is, and people will go there and worship because obviously it's the burning bush. Here it's burning. That one I'm not sure about. So, uh, but nonetheless, it's there. I just want you to know all these things have been verified because there it is. All right. So he, here's what's going on. A burning bush in the desert is not that, not that big a deal, right? It's not a big deal. B bushes would burn up. They would dry up and they catch on fire and they would burn up and they would extinguish. Not a big deal. So this one catches his eye, not because it's burning, but because it keeps burning, right? Bushes burn up. There's, there's, they're tinder. They're dry. They burn very quickly, and they're gone. And this one keeps burning and burning and burning and burning. And so Moses says, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. Okay, so burning bushes isn't unique. It's burning bushes that keep burning and burning and burning. Now, I know you know the story. Here's what I'm trying to ask. What's God like? He's like a burning bush that never extinguishes. Huh. What does that mean? You see, this is what we're trying to figure out. God is showing us who he is. What's he showing us? All right, let's see what goes on here. When, God, when the Lord saw that he had gone to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And he said, don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. That's what God's like. Like, isn't that just, he's in the middle of a desert seeing a bush burn that keeps burning. He walks towards it, and God starts speaking to him from the bush and says, stop, this is holy. And he's like, it's not holy, it's sandy, right? It's sand everywhere. That's what you'd see over there. There's, there's no greenery there whatsoever other than that bush that's at uh, uh, St. Catherine's Monastery. Um, but, but God is saying that this place is special, and the way God is to be approached is sandals off. 
Now, I don't know what to make of this. I'm just, notice God is telling us what he's like. When we're approaching him for Moses, even though you're in the middle of the desert, sandals off. This is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God is somehow manifesting himself, appearing in some way, shape, or form in this bush, through this bush, by means of this bush in some way, and Moses is recognizing that. And the bush, God is saying, don't forget, I am the one who had the covenantal promise with Abraham. Any time in the Old Testament you have, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what is being said is, I'm the God who made a promise to Abraham and renewed it to his son Isaac and then renewed it to his son Jacob. I'm the God who did that. It's a, it's a covenantal reminder. It's a covenantal formula. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I'm the one who made the promise. And again, I just briefly said, but the promise to Abraham was that I was going to bless you and bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Even though that's not been explained very much, that's the covenantal promise. And God says, that's who I am. And Moses at this point hides his face. So I'm just going to, what's God like? Well, encountering him is... What else could we say? It's an awesome experience. It's kind of frightening. It, it's, he's this consuming fire that doesn't get consumed, right? He, it's a bush that's burning that never burns up. It's the call to holy ground. And whatever Moses is seeing, and we don't even know here what he's seeing, but whatever he's seeing, he covers his face. Like this is something, this is something very, very powerful, the God who created all things. Then the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery um, yeah, verse 7, the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them uh, crying out because uh, of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Hmm. Keep asking yourself, what's God like? He's concerned. He's heard the misery that's going on with his people in Egypt, and he's concerned. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. There's a lot going on there when if we keep asking the question, what is God like? He's concerned about his people. I, I kind of... So in, in, in traveling in Egypt, you, you have the Nile River, which anything near or connected to the Nile River is lush. That's where the water comes from. So if you look at a satellite picture of Egypt, anything along the, along the Nile, that's where all their produce and crops and everything that's tied, anything they can get water from the Nile, they can grow amazing things. Anything else is as barren as the moon. I don't know how else to say it. I have not been to the moon. But my understanding is it's quite barren, and that's kind of what Egypt is. And you think, really, they ran out of space in Egypt? L like, that's the promise here, a good and spacious place. I'm going to get you your own place, kind of like you were running out of room in Egypt, which is just an interesting way to think about it, because there's unbelievable amounts of room in Egypt, just there's no water there. So the land that God has picked for his people is occupied. And you're like, huh, there's people there. And it's not merely one group of people. Look at the list. Is, is, is that six? Uh, home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, there's seven, right? There's seven people groups there, and some list, there's even more listed. So he's picked a land that people are already there, kind of interesting. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I think what Moses is saying in the who am I is I haven't lived there in 40 years. Uh, I'm now a resident of uh, 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 Midian. I I'm a Midian resident. And, and so, like, why would you pick me? But I think Moses knows he had a really unique upbringing, right? I mean, he's an Israelite raised in the home of Pharaoh. 
And so it's hard to tell, is he sincere with this, who am I? Although certainly as a murderer, he didn't want to go back, and, and so he stayed away for 40 years. God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you uh, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Okay, so this is the thing, where they were at this mountain, where this bush is burning and not being consumed up, where he has his sandals off and the ground is holy, this is going to be the mountain of God. And the way you'll know that, that, that you can trust me is, number one, you have to do it, right? Because he can't go, oh, that's a perfect sign, right? It's not until he does it that he leads them out of Egypt, that he gets them back to the mountain, then he can go, oh, yeah. Right? So it's interesting. The only way to get the sign is to actually fulfill and do the job. And so the job is to bring the people out of Egypt. And, and, and then the sign is that you're going to bring them right back here. And so when we're talking later in, in Exodus about them coming to the mountain, the mountain will use the name Mount Sinai more than it'll use the name Mount Horeb. But it's the same mountain. It's right here. That's what God is saying. Um, that's what I'm going to do. And that'll be the sign that you know you did the right thing is you're going to end up Right here, right where we are. That's, that's where this thing's going to end. Moses said, suppose I go, and I love how he thinks he can barter with God here at this point. Uh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So Moses starts with a few questions. The first question is, who am I? Right? And the next question is, who are you? He's trying to stall, especially if you've read this, you know that he doesn't really want to do this. But there's more going on with this idea of, what do I tell them your name is? Because God has already, in one sense, revealed his name, his name to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and so on. They already have names for God. Uh, Adonai, it would be, and, and uh, 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 would be the primary name that's being used at the beginning here. But... When Abraham asks, um, excuse me, when Moses asks for God's name, there's something else going on here. And, and so you kind of have to reconstruct this ancient worldview of the world. Ancient, that's too many worlds in there. Ancient worldview, period. Ancient worldview. And, and, and so they don't have the scientific mindset that we tend to have. And so it kind of works like this. Anything you can't explain... Anything you can't control would be understood to be in the hands of the gods. That's a small g and an s. People believed in many gods. Primarily, gods were regional. That would be, we would have a god here in Frisco, the god of Frisco, whoever would control that. And Plano would have their own god, right? Plano would be the, the god of Plano and, and, and so on and so forth. So gods tended to be regional. There tended to be a pantheon of them, that is, lots of them, and they tended to have a hierarchy. That is, there were gods that were bigger and stronger and more prevalent than other gods. And so, but, but their view of gods is really very, very low. And, and this is, I'm just talking about everyone in general other than God's people here. And, and we'll come back to Moses in just a moment. But basically the view is a god is, the, the words here, when I say it this way, you're going to think of the wrong thing. So don't think of the thing you're going to think about. Here we go. Uh, it, it's kind of like a god is a superman. Okay, I don't mean Superman. Don't think of the cape and the... Oh, now you're all thinking about that. Don't think of that. Just that, that it's a, a God is a man plus a little bit more, right? Just a little bit better than humans is what gods were. They didn't have a high view of gods. They had a low view of gods. And so if you knew a God's name, you then had the right to petition that God for whatever that God oversaw. Let me explain. So if you're a farmer and you know the name of the local rain god, that rain, because again, you can't produce rain, so it's in the hands of the gods. So if you need rain for your crop, then you need to know the name of the local deity who provides rain. Once you know the name, if you'll allow me the language, you can badger that god until he sends rain, which is how uh, foreign idol worship works. It's kind of badgering god. Let me give you a very quick picture. Think to Elijah on Mount Carmel, ready, and the prophets of Baal. What does Elijah want them to do? He wants them to badger Baal to show up 
and to burn the offering, to, to burn the sacrifice, right? And that's all you eat. You worship, you dance, you yell, you cut yourself. You do all the different things to try and get the God's attention. And, and again, because God's maybe not be listening, Elijah says maybe your God is sleeping, you know, maybe he's in the restroom, that kind of idea, strong language Isaiah or, or Elijah is using in, in, in that sense. And, and so knowing the name is the first step in being able to petition a God. And so... Why is Moses asking for God's name? What, what name do you want me to use? Moses said to God, suppose the Israelites say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask him, what is his name? Then what am I going to tell them? It's a little awkward to say, look, I was tending sheep. I went to the far side of the wilderness. I'm at the base of this mountain. I see a bush burning. I get there, the bush tells me to take my sandals off because it's holy, it keeps burning, and that's the one that told me to come, right? That's awkward. That's awkward to do back in Egypt in front of the Israelites. That's my calling. It was the burning bush that sent me. So what am I going to say? The idea behind whatever we're going to get from God is in the, in the pagan mindset, and I don't know what mindset Moses is, but in the pagan mindset, in the Egyptian mindset... This gives you some leverage against the God, small g. And my guess is Moses has a little bit of a pagan mindset because he's born and raised in Egypt in the house of a pharaoh. Does that make sense? I'm guessing his he is some pagan thinking. Am I saying he's a pagan? I, no, I just, he, he would think that way a little bit with the name. God said to Moses, It's a verb. So if you ask, well, so what's your name? Jumping. It's like, nah, it's, you, know, I'm, you know, if you came up to me after and said, man, I'd, I'd like to meet you. What, what is your name? Praying. My name's Praying. You're like, you, you want to pray? Well, no, no, it's my name. Like, the name is a verb. Okay, that's the first thing. But, but the name is in a tense, it's given in Hebrew here, it's all recorded in Hebrew, but it's in a tense that we don't have in English. The tense of this name is present future, okay? So let's just talk in English for a moment, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so if you think about it, in English we can still say these things, we tend to say them um, on an ongoing basis. So let, let, let's, let's go, you know, Cowboys. I'm sure there's some Cowboys fans here. So the Cowboys are and will always be my favorite team. Okay? Let's just say that as a, as a sentence. Does that make sense? So in English, we've got the present. They're my favorite team. And then I'm saying, but listen, you come see me in 31 years. They're still my favorite team. They're always my favorite team. Okay? Present, future. We would say it in two parts. Okay, in Hebrew, you can say it in one part. So God says, I, I am. It's my name, right? It's, it's the verb to be. A and yet, it not only means I am, and here it's recorded, I am who I am, which is an excellent translation. It's only one word. It it's, it's also, because in English, we can't do this, it's also, I will be whoever I will be. That is, don't you dare think that you can control me. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Tell the Israelites that's who sent you. Right? Surprising. Like, like this name it, it is really, it's so different than what you would expect. It doesn't feel like a name. Present, future, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. That is, no limits. My name is no boundaries. No, no, no leash on me. I, I'm the creator God. I'm a God who can speak to you from a burning bush and make you take your sandals off because this piece of sand is holy here at the base of Mount Horeb as we sit here by ourselves, right? And, and so I, I tell you all this because we're trying to answer the question, what's God like? And when we think of what's God like, look at like, it's a little strange how he presents himself, and obviously he's doing it very, very intentionally. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And I know you're thinking, that doesn't really read well in English, which is perfect. 
because it's really hard to talk about a name when the name is really a verbal form of he is the being one. He is the God who is. That is, you immediately get the sense that there was never a beginning, that there never is an end, and there's no way you could get in the way of this God. This God is. He's not the product of, you know, in mythology, you get this God over here, you know, the sun God, the moon God, they, and then here's the offspring, and then that's how this God was created. This God, the God who's talking to Moses, is. And always will be. No beginning, no end, all encaptured in a name. God also said to Moses in verse 15, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, covenantal formula reminding of the promise God made to Abraham, anytime we see that, that's what's going on, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is the name you shall call me from generation to generation. I'm going to take that as true for us today. That, that that's what God is saying. This is the name I want you to use. What's God like? He is the God who is. He is the God who will be. That is, he is a God without limits, without constraints. You, you can't box him in. You, you, you can't destroy him. You can't go back to a day when he wasn't, uh, that, that before he was created, because he always is. This is the name that you should use. This is my name forever. This is the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So sometimes we go, well, so what's the name? Well, the name is I am, right? It's all given to us in English. We go, well, okay, well, what's it in Hebrew? So in Hebrew, uh, if you remember in the Old Testament, and I, I love these ideas. I'm sure these ideas made sense back in the day. When you're writing Hebrew, since everyone knows what the vowels are, there's no reason to write them down. And so they only wrote in consonants. Now, there are vowels, just everyone knows what they are. So uh, the consonants we got from this particular passage are Y-H-W-H. And so we think we know what the vowels are, but you just need to know the vowels came uh, 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 2,000 years later, uh, 1,800 years later, okay? But we think we know how they vocalized it. They had vowels just because everyone knew them. They didn't write them down. And so we would say Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God. In Hebrew, you're perfectly fine in English, I am. So when we say, what's God like? God is revealing himself to Moses in the middle of a desert that when you approach me, it's so scary. There is a fear of the Lord where Moses covers his face. He takes off his sandals. He's on holy ground. And God says, tell them I am. That's what you tell them. Tell them I will be whom I will be. No limits, no boundaries, no way to constrain me. Uh, I am the God who can do anything. I'm assuming you know this story. God had a plan as to how he's going to get them out of Egypt. Ten plagues that are crazy, aren't they? He used real frogs to get them out of Egypt. You know, he used boils. He, he, he turned the water into blood. It's got to be, especially in Egypt, right? The, you turn the Nile into blood. The Nile is the source of everything. The Nile is the source of life. They worship two things. They worship many things in Egypt, but they're two main gods. The sun god Ra, because it's very hot there and it's always sunny, and the god of the Nile. And one of the plagues was darkness, where God doo -doo -doo, took the light bulb out of Ra. And the other one was he took the Nile and he turned it to blood. And then when they needed to, he turned it back for them, back to water. Had he left just the first plague where the Nile was blood, that would have decimated that country to nothing. That's their only source of water. I am. I'm the God who is. Go, verse 16, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Can you see that's important? God makes a promise. He reminds people over and over and over, I made the promise. Keep the promise. All through the Old Testament, if we could take the time to just simply read from here to the end of Malachi, you'd see that covenantal formula over and over and over. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
I'm the one who made the promise to Abraham. I'm the one who reminded Isaac of the promise I made to his dad. I'm the God who reminded Jacob of the promise I once made to his grandfather Abraham. That's the God who I am. And, and so he's reminded them, make sure you tell them, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and seen what has been done uh, to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land, <clears throat> pardon me, flowing with milk and honey. A land flowing with milk and honey. Imagery, milk and honey. What do you need for milk? Well, you need cows or goats, right? whichever way they're going at that point. How do you get cows and goats? Well, you need uh, pasture land for them to eat, right? How do you get pasture land for them to eat? You need rain. What's the most valuable resource in the Middle East? Don't say oil. We think it's oil because we don't live there. Rain, water, right? <laughs> How many have been to Israel? Just a few, okay. Well, quite a few, yeah. So... Is Israel a land that's known for its rainfall? Is it known as this place that's so abundant in water and, f and, and, and fields fill with grass so that cows or goats can eat to produce milk? It is if God sends rain. It's interesting. If you did, and no one does this, but if you did a study of rain in Canaan in the Old Testament, it's always a blessing of God. It's a promise of God. So he gives them, he gives them a desert. But the promise is, if you obey me, it'll rain there like you wouldn't believe, and you'll have milk. And those pasture lands will produce flowers, and flowers will attract bees. And at this point, I don't really know how that whole works, pollination, all that, whatever all goes on, and you end up with honey, right? The land of milk and honey is a land contingent on God blessing it. And there's times when the, in the Old Testament where Israel is faithful, God blesses the land, and it flows with milk and honey. And then they're faithless, and it dries up like a desert. Book of Haggai. Their crops are burning up and drying up. Why? They could care less about God. They're trying to build their own empires at this point. God's on hold. And God says, why would you put me on hold? I'm the source of your water. And eventually they go, you know what? It turns out God's the source of our water. Maybe we shouldn't put him on hold message of Haggai to rebuild the temple and, 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 and to allow the abundance and the reign of the Lord to come, come back and return. The elders of Israel will listen to you and they will, um, uh, then the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt won't let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Remember what I'm asking. What's God like? God is like a mighty hand, right? That's what the story of, of the Exodus is. It's the mighty hand of the Lord doing battle, as it turns out, with the gods, small g, uh, of Egypt. You worship Ra, the sun god, I turn the sun off, the plague of darkness. You worship the Nile, I turn it into blood. You worship the god of the frogs, I create frogs aplenty, right? You worship a locust god, I give you locusts that your locust god can't control. That's the idea here, that God has a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and I will strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them, and then they will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards you so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor uh, and, and, uh, and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters so you will plunder the Egyptians. God's plan. That's God's plan. So on the way out, <laughs> I kind of always liked your necklace. And the Egyptians are like, absolutely, and take the earrings that match. And they take the gold of Egypt, the wealthiest nation on earth, out with them. Why? Well, what's God like? He hears the plight of his people, and he doesn't merely want to pull them out. He does want to pull them out. He wants to introduce the Egyptians to who he is, and so he's going to use ten plagues, and it's going to be a prolonged period of time. And then he wants to bless his people 
with the abundance that Egypt has enjoyed, never acknowledging the one true creator. That's what God's like. So I would argue that every passage in Scripture is either explicitly, I would say this passage is explicitly telling us what God is like, or it's implicitly. That is, it's implying things that help us understand what God is like. You think of a psalm. Worthy is the lamb who is slain. And, and you think, huh, there's a worthiness to God. And of course, that's a reference to Christ and so on. You, you think of psalms that talk about the glory of God. Well, the glory of God, what's God like? I guess he's glorious because the psalmist is giving glory to God. What God is like, the better we understand that, it helps us how to live. That's the idea. What God is like will help us to know how to live. All right, so let's just follow this story a little bit. We'll go to the screens. We'll jump through uh, several different passages here. Exodus 6-7, uh, just as the story unfolds. I'm assuming you know the story of the Exodus, so I'm just trying to help with um, some key verses here. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So what's God like? He's the kind who takes his people and treats them as his own. I will be your God so that you will know that I am the Lord your God. And that's what part of this is. God's already their God. He just wants everyone to know it. And so he's going to do it a way that manifests himself and his mighty hand. That's what's being explained right here. So if you know the story, they cross the Red Sea. Well, I should just get them to the Red Sea. There's 10 plagues, right? And the last plague is the plague of death for the firstborn. And I always like to do this because it's just kind of shocking when you think about it. How many of you are firstborn? How many of you are firstborn? Just look at that. Just think of what that must have been like in Egypt. They lost all their firstborn. Every family, even the cattle, and I have no idea how that works, but nonetheless, the cattle lost their firstborn too. Mourning and wailing like you wouldn't believe. And then, of course, for God's own people, he provides a way. The lamb becomes the substitute. That is, all the firstborn are lost, but they're lost in the substitution of the lamb and the blood on the door so that the angel of death will pass over. And so Pharaoh says, fine, I lost my son, go, 10 plagues in, go, and they go, and, and it's, they go, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> they're following, and God manifests himself in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he does this, this is my own interpretation, so, so that they can't tell Moses, you're going the wrong way. Moses is like, I'm following the thing up there, right? You all can see it, we're just following it. And God leads them to a dead end. That is, they're pressed in wherever they are, and, and, and there are mountains, water in front, massive water, and Pharaoh changes his mind and Pharaoh behind, right? And, and this is so that God can act and show his mighty hand. That's what God's like. What is he? I am. What, what does he do? I will be what I will be. I will do what I will do. I have no limits. Watch this. And he takes this body of water and, and it's dry underneath. The water is piled up and they walk through and they close. This is Exodus chapter 15. What do the people do when God closes the water on the strongest army in the world? It literally eliminates the Egyptian army. They have no enemies chasing them now that they're on the other side. The, the army isn't unable to get to the other side. The army doesn't exist. They've been drowned. They sing. The very first song in the Bible is Exodus 15. It's what you do when God reveals his mighty hand. You sing. I just want, we should do the whole song. I just want to do one verse, Exodus 15, verse 11. Halfway into this song, they sing, who among the gods is like you, Lord? The gods, you know, Ra, the god of the, the Nile River, the frog god, and all the various aberrations that the Egyptians worshipped. Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Who is like you? Well, what's the implication? No one. What's God like? He's not like any other small g God. He didn't tell Moses, look, I'd like to deliver you, but me and the gods of, of Egypt, we're going to have a little battle, and I, I think I can take him, Moses, but, mm, you know, just in case, you just need to know I'll do my best. None of that. I'm the God who is. There was never a battle. 
There was never a challenge that, that, that God isn't one of many gods. He reveals himself as the God who is. <clears throat> uh, and, and so we see this uh, even as they sing, God is unique. There is no one like God. Well, I mean, the fun part would be just to kind of read through the Bible pa uh, passage by passage, uh, verse by verse, and just see God reveals himself in so many neat ways, so many interesting things. And I'd encourage you to do that. I'm going to jump just because none of you bought into the whole 97 hours tonight. So we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of keep moving here to, to another major passage. So, so quickly, that they, they get uh, uh, through the Red Sea. They sing. They sing about who is like the Lord our God, right? Who among uh, the gods are like you, Lord? And, and then they make their way to Mount Horeb, right? And, and, and past the burning bush, maybe, what, whatever that might be. And then you remember, eventually Moses goes up, people stay down. The mo mountain is shaking when God descends on it, and smoke and all that. And it's so terrifying that people say, uh, Moses, we don't want to hear from God. You hear from God and come back and tell us. We'll stay away. That's what it was like to encounter God, right? They literally, they were too afraid that they would die from hearing the voice of God. So when God speaks, it's awesome. And awesome in a wonderful and terrifying way. That's what they experienced. So Moses goes up, 40 days, they come down. And this is one of the first acts of magic in the Bible. Uh, they have all their gold and they put it all together. Whoop, a, uh, a calf comes out. I mean, no one really saw that coming. No one really knew how that happened. That's what Aaron told Moses. Hey, it just all, like the calf came out of the fire. I mean, who, who, could, who could know? And so they start wor worshiping an idol, and, and, and Moses comes down. And do you remember, not only do we have the problem of the calf, we have another problem with Moses who encountered God. He's glowing. Okay, this is pre-nuclear. What we would say today is, oh, I must have radiation exposure. That's why he's glowing. But he, no radiation. It was just an encounter with God where he had to veil his face. Now, remember, the people were hearing from God, and it's like, that's too terrifying. Moses, you talk to God. You come back, talk to us. Okay, fine. Moses goes up to God. Four days, comes back to talk to them. Moses, you're glowing. We can't handle it. Okay, we couldn't handle God speaking. We can't handle your glowing. So Moses has to wear a veil probably a little humiliating to say, here's what God said. And eventually, you remember, the, the glory of the Lord eventually wears off on the face of Moses. And so they make their way to the promised land, lots of disobeying along the way. They get right to the edge of it. They send in spies. The land is flowing with milk and honey, which means God had been sending rain before they got there, right? Because the land could have been dry and desolate. That's another option for that same piece of land. But it was flowing with milk and honey amazing land. And they're like, I can't believe it. The entire NBA live up there. They're super tall. I mean, does God know how to handle super tall people? We didn't have super tall in Egypt. And the cities had walls. Goshen didn't have walls. I mean, who could get into a city with walls? There is no way that the God who is, right? That's who he is, right? I am. I, I am. I will be who I will be. There's no limits. And yet, how could he handle tall people with walled cities? And that's what they say. We, we can't trust you to get into there. Do you, do you know all the people who live there? And they probably read the list back to God. And God's like, yeah, I told you all along. There's a whole bunch of people living there, and I'm giving it all to you. And then he even tells them why. I don't want you to have to build cities. They're building cities for you. You don't have to build your own vineyards. You don't have to build your own farmhouses. They'll build it for you. I'm going to give it all to you. It's unbelievable, the plan of the Lord. And, and, and so they send in spies, but they don't believe, and God says, okay. And they're like, okay, what? Don't believe. Well, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. Well, where are we supposed to go? I don't know. So you have 40 years of... I don't know, I'm not, not really sure what to do. It's interesting, we kind of think because we say they wandered, but you got to remember, they didn't know, they didn't know what they were doing. They, they were, like, they literally were wandering. That is, they had no plan, no purpose, no, no identity. They, they weren't Egyptians anymore. They didn't want to go back there, and they weren't in the, they just, and God sustained them in those 40 years. And then God gives Moses his last sermon, the book of Deuteronomy, and he represents the law to this younger generation as that unbelieving generation died off in those 40 years. And when he re-gives the law, he comes to this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, kind of the central passage for Israel. I don't know if I should say it this way. It's like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, if I can say that. It's, this is the verse that builds the nation of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the verse says, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 and 5. So God's speaking through Moses to all the people about to enter the promised land. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not the pantheon of gods from Egypt, not the pantheon of gods that were being worshipped in the land of Canaan. The Lord our God is one. And then the command, love him. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The idea with heart, soul, and strength isn't sort of that you should divide them up. It's that however you would divide up a person, all of it. So some people will say, well, I like to go body, mind, soul, spirit, right? In the book of Mark, actually, it's divided that way. So there's four components. Great. Four components is fine. Love God with all of them, right? Well, I see as a big part of who I am is my money. Fine. Add money to the list. Love him with that as well. So the idea is love the Lord you God with everything that you have, all your material parts, all your immaterial parts, that which is spiritual, whether you call that your soul or your heart, that which is physical. We are to be lovers of God. This is the command. Love the Lord your God. And so we look at the various commands of Scripture, and this command stands as... Well, hold it. What's God like? What kind of God are we supposed to love? Right? Do you see the importance of the question now? If the command is to love the Lord your God with everything you've got, your heart, your soul, your strength, and it gets repeated, if you remember, Jesus has asked about this, and he'll repeat this and on a couple of different times and so on. If that is the goal, what kind of God are we supposed to love? What's he like? It's really important to know what God is like if we want to fulfill the command to love him. That's my summary of the Old Testament. That's all, just the rest of it, just read. Maybe this week, that's a homework, if you want homework. Start at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, and read to the end of Malachi. You'll see it all just kind of fills in there, right? But, but that's, that's the command. This passage is so important. If you know the, the life of Israel or the life of the Jews today, they end up being told later in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if we had the time, we'd read the whole thing, that you're supposed to write this down and put it on your forehead. Have you ever seen uh, Jews wear these phylacteries on their forehead or bound on their wrists? And inside there, if you'd open up the phylactery and see what's written inside there, this passage. This is the passage the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not many gods, one. The God who is. That is, I am is the Lord our God. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is, sometimes you may have heard this called the great Shema. I don't know if you ever come across that. Shema is the first word here, right, this is how it starts. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, that first word here in Hebrew is Shema. And, and so sometimes you ever hear that, well, what's the great Shema? You're like, I, I don't even know who Shema is. Shema is the Hebrew word for here. It's how the passage starts in Hebrew. Hear, O, hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Egypt had a pantheon of gods. Babylon had a pantheon of gods, and the Canaanites had a pantheon of gods. And God is telling them, not me. The land they came from, lots of gods. The land they were going to, lots of gods. Those seven people groups, right, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, so on, lots of gods. Israel, one God. The God who is. The God without boundaries. The God without limits. The God that you can't tie down. You cannot constrain this God. And then we're called to love him with everything we have. Heart, soul, strength. Heart, soul, and strength in this case. That, that's Christianity. That's, that's, that's the whole thing. Right? Understanding who God is. 
loving him with everything we have. That is, Christianity is concerned with, or God is concerned with, how we think. Love him with our thoughts. You got an engineering degree, an engineering mind? Love him with your amazing abilities in engineering to calculate and so on. Figure out how to use that for his glory. You got artistic abilities, musical. You love him with that, with your soul, with your thoughts, your, your private thoughts, with your strength. Love him with your hands, love him with your feet, love him with your mouth, love him with your eyes. That's the command. And the command is going to get, you'll see, repeated in the New Testament, but there's more. This, this I mean, God is nothing like us. Right? Would you agree that what we've read so far, he just, he's, can you allow me the phrase, otherworldly? God is not like us. He wasn't, not like Moses and God, sometimes I get them confused. No, no, I mean, God was God and Moses was his servant, but there's no comparison. There's a message that runs throughout the Old Testament. If we had time, I'd show you 20 or 30 verses. There's only one God. There is only one God. No other gods. There's only one God. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we get to the New Testament, and John begins his gospel writing. The, the gospel that's written last, long after Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been written, John writes, and again, John was an eyewitness to Jesus. He was a friend of Jesus. He was the one who at the cross, when Jesus was crucified, Jesus said from the cross, essentially, John, here's my mom. Take care of her. I'm the oldest. I'm dying. You, he entrusts his mother to John. I mean, he's his dearest friend. John saw the resurrection. John saw the ascension. John was alive when Jerusalem was burned and destroyed in 70 AD. John knew of Peter's uh, crucifixion, probably. We think it was a crucifixion. John knew of Paul's beheading, his execution. John lived through all of that. I mean, John was the oldest living disciple, if we have all our facts straight from early church history. And so when John writes his gospel, he wants to help cover the things that maybe haven't been covered yet, and so he writes it this way. He doesn't start with Jesus' birth like Matthew or Luke, and he doesn't start with Jesus' baptism like Mark. He goes way back. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, oh, the, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. No, 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 no. God is one. I'm not sure John gets this, right? Doesn't, isn't this a little suspect how this starts? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It could even be translated, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God. I mean, you literally could put the word God at the end of that to make that make more sense in English. And now in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We keep reading through John. We get to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. This sounds a lot like two, doesn't it? If we're just honest, doesn't this sound like two? In the beginning was the Word who, who becomes flesh, and it turns out to be Jesus. So let's just go back and read this again. Allow me to replace the word with Jesus, since it's Jesus, right? John 1.14 tells us it's Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus is God. He was with God in the beginning. The Lord our God is one. Put it on your foreheads. Tie it to your wrists. Teach it to your children. How does this... I mean, what's God like? One God... Father in word, Father in son. One God, it's very clear. It's mentioned 70 or 80 times in the Old Testament in a variety of ways. One God. One God, and in the beginning, the Son was with the Father. Jesus was with God. God's revealed as Father. He's often called Father in the Old Testament. So we have God, the Father, and now we have God, the Son. There's lots of passages if we wanted to talk about Jesus' deity. There's lots, but just notice that John introduces him as God. 
All right, enough on Jesus. Um, again, your assignment for New Testament. Start at Matthew 1, read to the end. That'll get you Jesus, you know. So maybe you got a Monday, it's Wednesday. So Thursday, Friday, finish your Old Testament. Kind of Saturday, Sunday, work through the New Testament. We'll, we'll get this all covered. Here we go. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is... The Lord is spirit. No, 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 no. We already got God the Father. There's only one God. Now we have the Son who is with God the Father from the very beginning. And now we have the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Unveiled faces. What's Paul talking about? Well, who had the veiled face? <laughs> well, that was Moses. He's talking about the glory of God. And we who are with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness. Whose likeness? The Lord's likeness. With an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. One of many, many passages that I could show you that the Spirit of God is God. See, here's the teaching of the Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, the Father is God, and there's only one God. The Son is God, New Testament, and there's only one God. The Spirit is God, and there's only one God. What's God like? Well, there's only one God, and it looks a lot like there's three of them. How do we... How do we handle this? How do we love a God who's Father, Son, and Spirit, and there is only one? It's how the Bible presents him. There is one God. The Father is God, all through the Old Testament, over and over it's said. The Son is God, shown many times through the life of Jesus. You could establish that many different ways. The Spirit is God. Paul is saying it right here. There's only one God. So the easiest way to do this is to try and make God simple. Let's make this easy to understand. Let's just think about this for a moment. God began, remember we were in Genesis 1-1 when we got this thing kicked off, and, and God created all things. And now we, his creation, are trying to understand what God is like, and we've got this great idea, well, just make it simple. I'm going to go out on a limb. God's not simple. I'm going to go out on a further limb and say my job isn't to try and explain him to you so you can understand him. Because number one, I don't either. But we can understand some things about him. My job, I don't think, is to try and make sure that you get God, that you can answer that question, what is God like, that you can answer it easily and clearly. I think he's bigger than that. I don't think I can answer that question very easily. He's like a consuming bush that makes you take off your sandals as you get close. And he's got a mighty hand that killed all the firstborn in Egypt because they didn't bow their knees to him. He takes Ra head on. He went after the god of the Nile head on. He, he does whatever he does. He doesn't check with me. And so now he's revealed himself as father, son, in spirit, and there's only one God. As the gospel is being shared, and as people are coming to faith in the first century under the apostles, and then in the following centuries, early in the history of the church, you have people coming to faith out of the Roman Empire, where they believed in a pantheon of gods, and these people become believers, and people say, what's God like? What's your God like? Like, you're a Christian? What's that? A Roman might say. Well, how do you have these formerly pagan, newly Christian believers in Christ articulate what God is like? The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. That's what the Bible teaches. I could show that to you 26,000 different ways. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. You know what we end up doing? There's an early church uh, lawyer named Tertullian who invents a word, totally makes it up. And he goes, we've got to have a quicker way to say this. And so he takes 
the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. And he says, our God is triune. He's Trinity. We made the word up. Is the word in your Bible? Nope. Has nothing to do with your Bible. Oh, I only believe the things in the Bible. Fine. So what you believe is the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. And what I believe is that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. And I can say it in one word, Trinity. Does that make sense? The word isn't special in and of itself. It's made up. It's a totally made up word. Made up by a lawyer named Tertullian, but made up as a way to help us to understand what's God like. One God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Here's why it's important. Here's the command for today. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. you got to figure out what God is like. It's already he revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush and gave us the name I am, and he has these no limits and no boundaries. And now we've got to figure out how are we going to love a God who manifests himself this way that's so hard to explain. Right? It sounds to some like you just said three gods. We don't believe in three, three gods. We believe in one God. Well, it sounds like maybe one God with three outfits. Sometimes he comes as father. Sometimes he comes as son. Sometimes he comes... No, that doesn't work. You have the son praying to the father. You have the father and the son sending the spirit. If it's one God with three outfits, that doesn't work. It certainly makes it simple. And by the way, that's precisely what cults do. I don't know if you came this evening to me as a consultant for how to start a cult, but let me just help you. If you, if you got that on your to-do list this week, when you start a cult, the way you get a following is you take the complications of the Bible and you simplify them. That's what modalism is. Modalism is a simple way to understand God. One God has three outfits in the closet. Old Testament, he comes down as the father. New Testament, he puts on the son outfit. And after the son ascends to the right hand of the father, which is the same guy, in their mind, he sends the spirit. Simple, easy to understand. Nothing like our God. Nothing like how the Bible describes him. So what we need to do is we need to understand what is revealed. What we don't have to do is necessarily master how God can be like this, because not all of that is explained. So the question that we want to ask or or answer right now is, uh, what is the Trinity? And the Trinity really is a made-up word to describe the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there is no God. If you know anything about Augustine, he's the guy you always quote when you want to make an argument because he's a fourth-century Christian writer who is amazing, and so you always want him on your team. Here's what he said. If you can comprehend it, it's not God, okay? He, so, so we got to watch now, and I want to try and, and help us find a balance here, because what some people goes, oh my goodness, this is so hard, it's the mystery of the Lord. And so here's where they would go, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we might follow all the words of his law. And so what some people goes, huh, I mean, is it three and one, is it one and three, it's tricky mathematics, it's the mystery of God, and they walk away. It's not what the passage says. The passage says that which is secret belongs to the Lord. True. But the things revealed belong to us. And so that's the question. What did God say? And so we have to understand what God has told us. He doesn't tell us everything. What God reveals in the Bible is perfect, is correct, is true. But it is not exhaustive. He doesn't tell us everything. He doesn't explain everything. When we get to glory, you know what we do on Wednesday nights at 6.30? We gather around, I'm sitting there with you, and we get more explanation as to who our God is. There is more than just this. This is what he gave us. This is true, but it is not exhaustive. And so we don't just go, I don't know what God's like, and I... Because if you don't know what God's like, you will not know how to live. That's what our world does. Oh, I I hope I'm good enough for heaven. Well, do you think God has a standard? Yeah, and I think I'm I'm just over it, right? My life, I'm I'm just a little bit better than whatever that standard is. So what's God's standard? I don't really know. 
right? That, that's sort of what lots of people who consider there to be a God and to be heaven, that's kind of how they, uh, they might go through that. And so we want to look at a few passages here, and then we'll close. Common passage, Matthew 28, right at the end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. And, and this is kind of interesting here. The, the list we're about to read are all names. These are the names of God. This is The way this is written, baptize them in the name of the Father, and you could actually write it this way, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. They're all named. One God with three names, three manifestations. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It, it's... It's the God that we're introducing to the nations. This is what discipleship is, right? This is, we're trying to learn, and this is how God has revealed himself. What's God like? He's I am. He, he will be who he will be. Moses had no idea there was more coming. And as it turns out, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all the one God. Sometimes we'll use words like the Godhead to try and describe the three and, and so I don't use illustrations. Let me explain real, real, real quick. So some people, oh, yeah, it's like the egg. Yeah, if you look at an egg, that'll really help you understand our God, right? Because the egg has the, has the shell and it has the white part. I don't know what the white part's called. The white part and, and the yolk, right? That's the three parts in the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Yeah, so the Father's fully God. The Son is fully God. And the Spirit's fully God. The yolk's not the white. The yolk's not the shell. The shell's not the yolk, and the shell's not the white. You know what I'm saying here? That each part of the egg isn't the whole egg. God's not like anything made on earth. He, he's the kind of thing that the best illustration you can give is the only illustration he gives us. He says that when a man leaves his father and mother and is united with the wife, with the woman, they form one flesh. And that's an image of the triune God. Man is made in God's image. We all are. Woman is made in God's image. They all are. When man and woman unite in one flesh in marriage, you get a glimpse of God. That's the only image we get. For us, he keeps it a little simpler. It's just two, man and woman. For him, it's father, son, and spirit. But it's why there's no such thing as changing the definitions of marriage. That doesn't make sense. Marriage is a glimpse of God. God isn't father, father, father. It's not, it's not father, son, son. It's not any other aberration. It's father, son, spirit reflected by his design because we're all made in his image, male and female. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, I want you to see this more in Scripture because you're probably, maybe you, you aren't aware of how common this is. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, this is right at the end of 2 Corinthians, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You, you see how they're brought together in, in, in that? There's, there's more obscure ones, a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. The Lord is a reference to Jesus. There are different kinds of working, but the same God, the Father, who works uh, all of them in all men. There are many, many, many passages, especially in the New Testament. I nicely lifted, listed 16 here. We won't go through all of them, but all showing the Godhead. Why are we doing this? Because I'm suggesting the Bible tells us What's God, what God is like. The command is, love the Lord your God with everything you got. What's the God that we are to love? We've got to be able to answer that. 1 John chapter 4, we'll end here. 1 John chapter 4. So this also is written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote uh, the Gospel of John. This is Jesus' disciple. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also wrote the book of Revelation. So five books. 
<coughs> one of my favorite passages in Scripture. All right. Chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So it begins with a warning. Careful. I want to talk to you about what God is like. Watch it. Don't get this wrong. Test and see. That's what he's saying. There are many that have gone out into the world. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit, uh, the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So in the days of when John is writing, there's this big deal going on between flesh and spirit that is out of the writings of Plato, the Greek philosopher, which happened in the intertestamental period, the time between the Old Testament and the, and the New, Plato suggested that that which is real is spirit. In other words, I'm a bad representation, my body, what you see here in front of me of who I really am. That is, I might let you down, I might break the law, I might sin, but that's my body, and body is bad, but spirit is good. And, and so Plato begins to philosophically introduce this dichotomy between that which is physical, which is bad. God created the world, it's bad, right? That's where sin is, and your body is bad, and my body is bad, and all that's physical is bad. But behind all the bad, you're really a good guy. Your body's no good. But inside, you're good. And so, and so there's already a movement to deny Jesus comes in the flesh by the time 1 John is written. And John says, start with that. You want to deny who God is, who sends his own son to enter into humanity, to die for their sins? Acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus uh, uh, acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. That is, Antichrist means against Christ, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The Antichrist is here. If I was speaking 100 years ago, the Antichrist is here. If I was speaking 500 years ago, the Antichrist is here. There's always Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist in the world. It's an interesting exercise. I would encourage you to think about this. Who opposes Christ in our world today? Who is, I mean, many do. Who's the most influential in the opposition of Christ? I don't know. There's no, no answer. But it's interesting to think about. The Antichrists are always with us. There's one that's coming. John says, don't worry about that. They're already here. They oppose Christ. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome uh, them, and the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Uh, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. Who's them? The Antichrist, those who oppose Christ, who don't acknowledge Christ coming in the flesh. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever does not know God does not listen to us. This is how we can recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Okay, so you need to be loving because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. That's what the Trinity is. That's what the Trinity is. Love. And every now and again you get a glimpse of how it worked before anything was created. Jesus in John 17, it's called the high priestly prayer, and it happens at the Passover when they're celebrating just before he's about to get arrested. And, <clears throat> and he prays, and let me quickly get to it here. And he prays, John 17, verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you've loved me before the creation of the world. You want to know what happened before Genesis 1-1? I can tell you. There was the Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father was loving the Son. Do you know that's why you're created? You weren't created because God needed you, because God is love. 
he's always been in perfect fellowship, perfect communion with himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. But his love for the Son was so much that he said, through the Son, by the Spirit, let's create so that my creation can experience the love I have for you, Jesus. And what does Jesus do on the cross? He accomplishes salvation which adopts us in as sons. We love because God first loved us. So from Deuteronomy, the command is, love the Lord your God. And from John, 1 John 4, the command is, love others because God loved us. God is love. That's his nature. What's God like? <laughs> He's love. Father, Son, and Spirit. What are we to be? Loving. Father, we're grateful that you've made yourself known. That when we ask the question, what are you like, you can answer us. You're love. You're not merely loving, you are loving, but you are by definition what love is. How you, the Father, have loved your Son and sent your Son to accomplish your purpose on the cross that we could be clothed with Christ's righteousness and find forgiveness and salvation through Jesus and then that we could be indwelt by the Spirit that we could live and serve you. Help us to love with all our heart, soul, and strength because you are love, because you have loved us, help us to love others. A command that we need to live out every moment of the day with our minds, with our hearts, with our soul, with our strength, with everything that you have given us. Help us to reflect on your love to show our love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.